While we were there, I just sensed the presence of the Lord so, so greatly. And, you know, we feel like there's a mantle for revival or different things, but this was a specific. And so that's what we were praying while we were there. And I sensed in the spirit that in the great cloud of witnesses, Mr. Cashwell was watching us. The Lord allowed him to see us honor him and the work that God had done through him that touched so many people in the Carolinas. And I just wanted to share that with you. It's a powerful, powerful spiritual experience that we had while we were there. And I'm feeling it again. And you know, that there is that, oh gosh, there's an anointing yeah. that started then, that started in Azusa, that started in Acts chapter 2 that is being passed and this is a powerful thing God is doing and, and it's not a flash in the pan thing we don't want that we want the thing that is going to change the fabric of our society so let's just receive that Lord we receive oh God we receive it we receive what you're doing oh thank you Lord for bringing us together and honoring us to be a part. Go ahead, take it. Take it. Jesus. Jesus, wow. Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, Najibi Cashwell was responsible for starting many movements. I think the Church of God actually began. He was a black preacher, a holiness preacher. And they had revivals in the tobacco warehouses. And the, you know, I bet that was really interesting when the fire broke out in the tobacco warehouses. I bet, I bet it was really amazing. You know, but thank God for him and for many, you know, that plowed, that sowed, that went as pioneers. Wow, that was really powerful this morning. But there was some convergence of fire. I wouldn't be surprised if something, well, it's already something amazing is happening. There's always more happening in the spirit than there is that you could see with these eyes. But it's really a special morning. I felt like, you know, I said, Lord, this is like one of the most important messages I've ever preached. But then most of you that know me, that's the way I feel every Sunday, whether it is or not. I always feel that way. And then sometimes when it's over, the devil comes and says, you know, that was the worst message in the history of Christendom. I really, it's just something I've dealt with anyway. I've learned to say, no, it's not the worst in history. Maybe number two or three, but it ain't that bad. Get thee behind me, you know what I mean. But anyway, I want you to go to Romans, and uh, we're going to look at some things. Um, Romans chapter 1. But I do believe this is a very important word. And remember last week, I want to build on where we were in a scripture that we pointed out. And that scripture was, um, well, let me just begin this way. I believe God is going to raise up more than what we read out of Hebrews chapter 11. Remember the hall of faith. Men and women that accomplished great feats. They, things happened that were humanly impossible if not for their faith in God. And I believe God's going to raise up a part two of that. Many are going to be known as being a part of the hall of faith. Now, they're not going to be added to the canon of Scripture. You know that's closed. But maybe when, no, no maybe. When we get to heaven, those that God used in these days that were a part of these great exploits that we're going to be a part of, Somehow, they're going to be recognized, their works, the things they did. I know we'll cast our crown at his feet, but somehow they're going to be known. And then, remember, we spoke about how Noah, he had faith, and he demonstrated great faith in his day. He was divinely, remember, warned in a dream of things not yet seen. They'd never even heard of what he said was coming. 
and yet it came and um, but he because of the warning he moved remember we said with godly fear say godly fear you don't want earthly fear you want but you do want a godly fear you have a godly fear you will move and do what he says it, that's the way it happens and because of his godly fear he prepared what an ark now, I was sharing this with Jerry. He pointed out, you know, it took about 80 years to build that ark. I looked it up. It's really 55 to 75, 80, somewhere in that range. We don't know exactly. Can you imagine he woke up some mornings thinking, why am I doing this? Why? Why am I building an ark? That was 25 years ago, 35, 45, 50. You know, but he kept on. And he prepared an ark. And what happened? He saved a household, his household, those who he was responsible for. And then uh, in doing so, he condemned the world because there was a contrast made between the righteous and the wicked. And it pointed to the judgment of God that was coming. And it came. And then it says that he became an heir of righteousness that comes through faith. Now, Romans chapter 1 And uh, verse 16, verse 17, let me just uh, read that, and then we're going to jump into this word. And, you know, Michael, that young man that wrote that book, prayed over me, uh, was it Friday morning? And, um, you know, I just appreciate those divine moments that you could never plan. If you planned it, you'd mess it up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? God just plans things. And anyway, that was a real blessing. So anyway, look at this. Verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed. Say, I'm not ashamed. You're going to be put to the test. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Their faith. Now the title of this is From Faith to Faith. And I believe it's a clarion call for the hour to live as men and women of faith in these times. Now, regardless of the situations, circumstances that we find ourselves in, The Scripture confirms that we're going to move from glory to glory. Remember that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, from strength to strength, Psalm 84, and from this Scripture, from faith to faith. So that means, if I understand it correctly, there's going to be an increase of glory, an increase of strength. Now I know we boast in our weakness that the power of Christ would rest upon us, But I also know that the weak are to declare that they are strong. I am strong. Let the weak say I'm strong. And then there's going to be increasing faith. Because we're going to demonstrate, like Noah, demonstrate faith and the righteousness of God. So let's just pray with me and then we'll get into the Word. Lord, thank You for this morning. Thank You for the incredible time of worship Lord, thank you for your anointing here right now, Lord. God, we just pray, Lord, just help us only say the things that you're saying, but give us ears to hear what all that you are saying. And even, God, we want to know, we want to hear, but we want to walk in. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we are a people of faith, and the just shall live by their faith especially in this hour, and everyone watching, everyone in this room, I pray for an impartation of faith to live in this season of time. Lord, that's not from men. It comes from above. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to begin this morning, we're going to go into Romans, look a little bit more into Romans chapter 1, but we're going to look at the context of what was happening as Paul was writing this, understanding that the gospel is more than facts to believe. It is a life to be lived. Say that. Say the gospel is more than facts to believe. 
It is a life to be lived. And then we're going to look at the challenge that you and I have in living in this day, such as we see. And then not only the challenge, the call that God has given us. And then we're going to pray for the faith to be imparted to answer the call. It's one thing to be called. It's another thing to be those that answer. They rise up and they walk out the calling of God. That's, I believe that's going to define us in this day. Now look in Romans uh, chapter 1. And um, I like that in verse... We'll just back up. Look in verse 8 real quick. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. You know there are people that know about Moravian Falls all over the world? It really is incredible. It's not because of us. It's just because God is doing something through us. But that's the way it ought to be. You ought to be known. You're already known in hell. Hell is a, you know, they're on alert because of who you are and because Jesus is living inside of you and you believe Him. You dare to believe what God said. So you might as well be known in the earth because we give Him all the glory anyway. It's better. And then that way nobody knows who you are. They, well, who are you? But God is moving in your midst and so God gets a lot of glory that way. But anyway, it's not a testimony of us. We always point to Him. And in this hour, we be quick to point to Him. Our faith can ignite faith in others. You know, if you walk in faith and others are struggling, they can be ignited. They can be encouraged because of what you're walking in. How many of you know that? We need one another. Now, let's just... um, All of that's good. We could spend all day. But look in verse 18. Now, this is the context. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the word revealed, before I read on, is similar to the word revealed, the word used in Revelation chapter 1, referring to Jesus, the revelation. In, in, Hebrew, or in Romans, it is the word uh, apocalypto, but in Revelation, it's apocalypse. And so there's a similarity. The apocalypse, they both are, they refer to the revelation of Jesus and the revelation of the wrath of God. The church has to make known. In fact, the word revealed means to be plainly signified, distinctly declared, set forth as in motion, to be discovered in its true character, manifested, appear, disclosed, or be revealed. And that's part of what the church is to do. We are to make known the Lord Jesus and His coming. And all that that means. You you guys are on the same page. This is our job. It's our job description. How many of you know the devil's job description? Steal, kill, and destroy. Is he fulfilling his job description? Jesus came to give life. You and I are in the business of life. And you have to present the whole gospel so that people understand, if they do not have that life, what the alternative is. Noah, for all those years, declared the judgments to come. I can imagine the people mocking him. Where is the promise of your judgments? It's been a lot of years, Noah. Nothing's happened yet, you know, but anyway. So let's go on and just read. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him. You know, Linda sent me a little word. You know, atheists... Even atheists believe. How did you put that? Because they know who he is. Even demons believe and they tremble. That's what the scripture says. And even those, I think, that claim to be atheists, on their dead bed, they will change their mind. They will wonder. 
What am I going to face when I take my last breath? Well, you can, let me tell you, you can make sure that you're ready to face. You don't have to enter your last breath without hope. And anyway, let's go on and read. They, they knew God. They, they knew. But they didn't glorify Him. Nor were they thankful, but because they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. You know, it's better to be a fool in the sight of men and wise in the sight of God than a fool in the sight of God and wise in the sight of men. I mean, if you know. And they changed the glory of the invisible or the incorruptible. God into an image made like corruptible or perishable men. That's what that means. They made an image of God in their own image. They made God up the way they wanted Him to be. It was like birds and four-footed animals. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up. This is the first time this is mentioned. One of three times in this text. God gave them up. To uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts. To dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. You walk in one or the other. You walk in the truth or you walk in the lie. You can't walk in both. It has to be one or the other. And they worshiped and served the creature, man. 666, the epitome, all that man is. They worshiped man rather than God, who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up. That's the second time to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use, even nature knows what's right and wrong. That's what he's saying. But they exchanged the truth for a lie, and even the natural use of the woman. They burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... They said, don't, I don't want to know. In fact, this scripture will probably be banned in one day. If not already, hell hates Romans chapter 1, as well as Romans chapter 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6, and 7, and 8, and 9, and 10. And even as they did not like to retain God, God gave them over. So here's the third time. It's almost like three strikes and you're out. Now that's not it. But he gave them up, he gave them up, he gave them over. There comes a time God says, okay, this is your heart. It's over. Over means what? It's over. When Noah closed the door, it was over. Forever. That was it. And there will be a day. When it will be over. To a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, and whisperers. You know what whispers are whispers are. Gossipers. That's the next word is backbiters. They are the ones who get behind the door and they speak against you and they think. Well, you don't hear what they say, but guess who is? Haters of God. It's interesting, haters of God follows backbiters and gossipers. That's interesting. Violent, proud, boasters of inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. What does that mean? It's rebellion to spiritual authority. Regardless, you know, that's the basic and the natural parents But I think it's spiritual authority. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving. All of this is in the same context. Unmerciful, who knowing the righteousness, judgments of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, that's pretty much the context, and we could have said a lot more. But then there's the challenge. The challenge begins with verse 32. The challenge will be living separate from the world. But are not in Babylon. Let me tell you, Babylon is going to come down. 
God is declaring war against the Babylonian system, and so it's being exposed. It's being exposed in Ukraine as to what is happening and all that. And God has declared war. Now, you know if God declares war against you, there's probably a good chance you will not survive. How many of you know that? God wins. God wins. I've never seen one time when he's defeated. Not once. It looked like he was defeated. For three days, he was not defeated. What they thought was defeat resulted in the greatest triumph in all of history. And then in chapter 2, you know, that's really too. It says, therefore you excusable are inexcusable. Those of you that judge, if you condemn yourself if you're doing the same things. That's what he's speaking of. And he goes on, don't judge if you're practicing the same things. But also in, in verse 32... Not only those who commit such acts are worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. There's no other explanation. But the gift of God is eternal life. But not only those who practice, but those who approve. You ever heard somebody say, Now I'm not for abortion, but I'm going to vote for this person. No, you are. You are, according to this scripture, not only those who do those things, but those who approve. The word approve means to agree in principle, to give your stamp of approval, your confirmation, your vote of confirmation. I don't agree with this person, but I know you do exactly. Agreeable, you're willing, and you're on board. That's what the scripture says. So the challenge in the hour will be, First of all, make sure you're not walking at, make sure you're separate, you're living separate from the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You don't condemn, you're setting a standard, but you're not going to agree. You're not going to give them your stamp of approval. You know, one of the men that was, Jerry, you know that the man Duncan, they have the Catch the Fire churches, and there are about 200 churches around the world. And they have a ministry, one of the fire ministries in Raleigh, Catch the Fire. And they were saying how their daughter was in college, and they would laugh at her. Because she was a Christian. And they would laugh at her. Laugh at her because she believed in marriage. And everybody else in the classroom believed you can marry whoever you want to marry. There's no set definition. And anyway, she responded in an amazing way. One guy publicly was just in the classroom putting her down. Putting her down. And she stood up. Stood up at UNC Chapel Hill and said, You have the right to believe what you. I have the right to believe that I believe man, marriage is between a man and a woman. And I am greatly, I don't agree with you, so I have the right. You must give me my opportunity to speak what I believe. And she did. And she said they never said that was the end of the persecution in the classroom. As long as when she was quiet, they kept persecuting her. She rose up and said, I believe this, and I have the right to believe it. Anyway, you got to stand up. That was the, the moral of that story. If the church does not lift up a standard, what happens? Evil will be looked on as good, and good will be looked on as evil. And then there's the call. Look in verse 14 of that scripture. Verse 14. I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor. What is it? A debtor is just going to remain silent? You don't want to offend anybody. So I'm just going to be quiet while you die in your sin? No, I'm a debtor. Both to Greeks and to barbarians. The wise and the unwise. And I'm ready. Oh man, we'll get to that. Because that's really powerful there. I am ready to preach the gospel in Rome. Now, Rome, think about that. I'm ready to preach the gospel in Rome. Rome had already become the world's wealthiest city at that time. Political, military supremacy, architectural splendor. Man, Rome was an amazing place. But did you know in that hour, they practiced censorship. If you agreed with the authorities, and whatever they said was right, it was like a political correctness, 
you would be accused of treason if you did not agree with what the word of the hour was. So they just would censor you. There was favoritism, mistrust, corruption politically. Economic system was based on corruption. Now, now there was many... No, no, this happened. This was the days just before Nero. Do you remember what happened with Nero? The Christian, obviously, Paul's preaching the gospel in Rome was having a great impact. The church was growing in Rome. The believers were blossoming. So Nero decided he was going to get rid of the Christians. You know what he did? It's the first false flag attack in history. He set the city of Rome on fire, and then he blamed the Christians, which caused great persecution to arise. Persecution such as, I don't know, that we've ever seen in all of history. They would line, they would impale the believers on poles and lift them up, set them on fire. They served as like torches, and it was the most cruel. It's interesting Right before the persecution, Paul preached the gospel to the Romans. Now, Rome didn't fall immediately. It took a little bit of time later after that. But it fell. And when it fell, it fell hard. It didn't, uh, Rome wasn't built overnight. It didn't fall overnight. But the seeds were there. And so the only answer was the gospel. Now, what do you think the answer for America is today? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed. The word ashamed means embarrassed or fearful what men will do to me. We're all going to be put to the test. Are you embarrassed? You know, as long as you you get around a crowd and you say, hey, the man upstairs, nobody's going to persecute you. You say Jesus around the water fountain or whatever, that's when the temperatures rise. Are you embarrassed? Are you fearful? Paul said, I am not ashamed. And I believe God's raising up people in this hour. I am not ashamed. It's too late in history to be ashamed now, buddy. I believe God and I'm going to stand. Even if I stand up in the classroom at UNC Charlotte, when every, no, not Charlotte, Chapel Hill, maybe in Charlotte too. Maybe in Greensboro, too. I don't know. But everybody had a perverted view of marriage, at least those who stood up and spoke. Sometimes there are people embarrassed, so God raises up someone with boldness. Maybe others said, hey, you know, that's the way I believe. I was taught that, too. My mom and dad told me. Marriage is between a man and a woman. In fact, nature will tell you that. It doesn't look around. You don't have to look very far to know that. But anyway... From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. I believe it's a clarion call for the times. So there was the the context, the challenge, and the call is to live in this hour as men and women of faith. Now, this is where I'm going to go now, and this is how we're going to lead to the prayer. But I felt like the Lord said, faith is, number one, faith is. Number two, faith in. Number three, faith for. Faith for, and number four, faith of. You're going to need all this. Faith is, faith in, faith for, and faith of. So, first of all, faith is, and um, Richard already gave us a definition. He said that that faith was in this room and uh, online, and I believe that was a word from the Lord. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. So you're hoping for what you cannot see. That's what Noah, that's where Noah was. Not that he was necessarily hoping. He just knew what God said. He couldn't see it, but he believed because God said. And so faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. Faith is not believing what I see. It is seeing what I believe God has said. I want you to repeat that. I, I want this to get in your spirit. Say, faith is not believing what I see. It is seeing what I believe God has said. Just say that again. Faith is not believing what I see. It is seeing what I believe God has said. 
You know, uh, when you look this up in the, um, in the original Greek, it refers to having the title deed of something before you actually have that something. Like somebody gives you the title deed to a car, which today would be a wonderful t- man. That would be great. Now you gave me the title deed, now show me the car. That's what I'd say, because they're getting hard to find. Anyway, it's, I mean, they're very expensive. They're just going up and up and up. But you have the title deed of what God said before you see it. So it's not based on what you see. It's based on this deed that you hold in your hands. And in regard to us, it's the deed we hold in our heart. Because it's believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth, believing in our heart. You know, when Abraham said, you'll be a father of many nations, that made no sense. Made no sense. I mean, you know, it made no sense. But in hope he believed, the Bible said, so that he became the father of many nations. It says, in contrary to hope, he believed. He had hope in contrary to what it's, you know, what God says is more powerful than what I see. The evidence, or it's the confidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is. Say faith is. It's the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things not seen. The evidence of things hoped for. But it's all ours. It's ours in Christ Jesus. And we're not going to be ashamed. And then secondly, faith in. Say faith in. You know, one of the great scriptures you might want to remember today. Look over in 2 Timothy in uh, chapter 1. It's one of those you would want to um, write on the tablet of your heart. Okay, make sure it's there so you don't forget it. But uh, notice 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. There it is again. Same word, nor of me as prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. What a strange verse that is. Sufferings in the same context with the power of God. That I might know him in the fellowship of his sufferings and what? The resurrection. The power of his resurrection. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our own works, but according to His own purpose. That should really mean something to us. It's not based on me, on my works, on my goodness. It's the purpose of God written out for me from before the foundation of the world. That should make you pretty secure in who God is. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. Not according to our own work, but according to His purpose. And grace which was given to me through in Christ Jesus. Now he goes on, verse 11, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And for this reason I also suffer these things. You, he suffered because of the call of God upon his life. The call of God was there. The enemy comes to get to, to seek, to get us off of the call or to back off of what God said we're called to be. How many of you know that? Because we're a threat. If we obey the call of God, then the kingdom of God is advanced. The kingdom of darkness is demolished to some degree. And so the enemy threatens us and wants us to back off of the call. He was called. Verse, now, verse 12, this is the scripture I want you to remember. For this reason... I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, say nevertheless. I am not ashamed. Say it again. I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. Say it. And I am persuaded that He is able to keep what I've committed to Him against that day. Or until that day. It means until the end. How many of you know that verse by heart? How many of you will will memorize that verse? I'm asking you, memorize it. All right, let's look at it again. For I know in whom I have believed. Say it. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed unto him until that day. 
you may want to keep it in your heart. Faith is not in man. Man, I, I, I'm losing confidence in all men. Jesus, that's why Jesus said, hey, there's none good. He knew what was in the heart of man. There was only good, and that was the Father. And so it's to the degree that we yield and surrender. I'm not, faith is not in my ability, my strength, or my weaknesses. I'm not going to let my weakness dictate who I am. Because I'm weak, but He is strong. So let the weak say they are strong. It, it's not in my opinion of, uh, of myself or others' opinions of me. If we cared about what other people thought about us, we would live depressed every day. Woe is me. Do you know what they think of me? Gee, you know what I think the Lord probably says? What do you think they think of me? You don't, faith is not in my feelings. How many of you still deal with this? Feelings. You wake up one morning feeling great. The next morning you wake up feeling like a rotten egg. Well, I must have lost my faith in my sleep. It's gone. What happened? Where'd you go, God? It's not in my experience or my grid of what I think should happen or what I've seen happen. This is the past. God, you've always done it like this. Surely you will do it again. It's not, faith is not in faith. Faith is in God alone. Great faith. Say this. Great faith comes from having faith in a great God. Whose purposes for me are great. You need to say that again because some of you died out at the end. Great faith comes from having faith in a great God. Whose purposes for me are great. How could they not be? He's God. And then faith for whatever comes my way. Now this is where it gets serious. Faith is for not only what I believe, but how I live. It's what, whatever comes my way. Remember John 16 The disciples told Jesus, we believe that you have come from God. Jesus said, okay. It was like a wake-up call. He said, the hour is indeed coming that you will be scattered. In other words, he wanted them to know, okay, I hear what you're saying. But will you say that when things have changed and they're no longer as you think they should be? When life is changed looking a lot different you know things are different now I told you from time to time I still read Oswald Chambers because to me it's the greatest devotional ever written and I know I've read it many times but I read it and it still speaks to me and I was reading this week and it just more confirmed what I was to speak this, to this Sunday and, but it was called The Way to Permanent Faith And he said that Jesus, you know, in that scripture, was not rebuking his disciples. Their faith was real. But he said, after you have this salvation experience, our faith must be exercised in the realities of everyday life. You say you have faith, but you should live out your faith in everyday life. Even at times when there is the death of of the blessings of God. What are you talking about? Does God, does God have the right to engineer our circumstances? Does He? The steps of a good man are ordered. All things work together for good to them that love Him are called according to His purpose so He can engineer. What if He engineers the death of the blessings? Is that in Scripture? Job said, though you curse me, yet will I trust in you. Chambers goes on, he said, dark times are allowed and they come to us through the sovereignty of God. Are we prepared to let God do what he wants until Jesus Christ is truly our Lord? If we are willing to wait, we will see God pointing out that 
we have been interested only in His blessings instead of Him alone. And this really fit with this week, this weekend. The woman from Wales. We need to get her to come too. In fact, if you're on our email list, make sure you're on. There's a list out there. You should sign up on her email. I'm going to send everybody her message. Oh, my goodness. I wasn't there for the whole time. I just was there to connect, to bless what God was doing. But this woman's message, she's from Wales, so she could see what's happening in America from a different angle. And uh, so she was sharing what she saw in the Western church. So I'm going to send it to everybody that's on the mailing list this week, on the email list. But uh, she spoke about how we've become a, a celebrity church in America. And we've seen that. Celebrity. And then mammon was the next thing. And then, you know, just this commercialism. If you don't like, then you know you can go to a coffee shop and you can order your latte or you know, give me cocoa or, you know, what do they put, oat milk, oat creamer, <laughs> whatever. We don't even go to Starbucks. I've not been to Starbucks in a long time. But anyway, you can, if you don't like your coffee from that coffee shop, just go to another. Go to another coffee shop. So they'll tell you, give you what you want, what you order. That is so foreign from Scripture. That's why I despise it. I love the people, but I despise. Because it's not the New Testament standard. We are a covenant family. You're a family. God's a father. And we have brothers and sisters. You work out everything. I'm telling you. Anyway, God have mercy on the American church. But anyway, she said, you know, right now we're in a lot of trouble. And so the church is crying out for divine intervention. She said, that is not what God is looking for. She said, God's not looking for you crying out for divine intervention. He wants you to cry out for God's incarnation. Now, I'm sitting back there. It's one of those things that came. And I said, I hope she repeats that because I need to hear that again. And she did. It's not divine intervention that you ultimately need. I'm not saying you never pray that. And she wasn't saying that. But it's more than that. It's incarnation. Not reincarnation, but carnation. You know, I mean, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Where is Jesus supposed to be lived out? Through us. Paul's desire was until Christ is formed in you. That's why they were to go through all those challenges so that Christ would be formed. And does not the Scripture say in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave Himself for me. And so what we need, it's not so much divine intervention, because you know what that's based in? comfortableness. God, come and rescue me because I don't want pain. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to see my children live through want and lack. Wait a minute. There's no want to those who put their faith in Him. Those who trust in Him. Though you walk through the valley of shadow of death, you'll fear no evil. So it's almost like we've departed from the foundation of truth. We're crying out, God, rescue us. Get me out of this mess. What if he's looking to be not reincarnated, but carnated? What if he wants us to walk out Jesus? He wants to live in us and walk out through the world and whatever's coming our way. Does that make sense? So I'm going to change my prayer in that. Because I, too, have prayed, God, just come and get us out of this. Come, Lord, we need divine intervention. Divine, get us out of this. God, help. And not that we don't pray that. But yes, manifest the Son of God through... What's all creation waiting for? The sons of God who reveal the Son of God. Jesus. He's the answer. We are living epistles. We're walking examples 
of who Jesus is. He said, even as I am in the world, or, yes, so you are to be. So we are to live out who He is. He's to live through us. That just made a lot of sense to me. But anyway, Christ in us. Doesn't the Scripture say it's Christ in us, the hope of glory? The Passion Bible said it this way. It says, the righteousness given to us when we believe moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living life by faith. And the faith we have gets in us so that we can walk out the faith and others will see our testimony. And that's the next thing. The last thing is the faith of. The faith of. Okay, this is over in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, where it says, have faith in God. Everybody know where that scripture, you know that, have faith in God. And yet, if you study it out, many believe that that is better translated, have the faith of God. You can read it. You study it out for yourself. Have the faith of God. Now, is that in context to interpret it that way? Well, what the next verse, Jesus said this. He said, surely I say to you. I say to you. I say, say me. Okay, so he's saying to you and me. I say to you, whatever... Whoever says to this mountain be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have what he says. So Jesus is speaking about those who follow him and that they were to demonstrate and live that life out. The faith of God. Was there anywhere else in the, in the Scripture, Lord, that that can be found? Yes. Yes. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. It's a picture of the, I believe, the last day believer, the disciple. And if you haven't, if you haven't realized yet, either this is it or this is a preparatory stage. We'll pass on the mantle to the younger generation here. But this is it. It's got all the qualifications. Everything. It's like the days when Paul said, I'm not ashamed and I'm ready to preach the gospel to Rome. And the church began to explode in Rome. But then the wickedness overtook persecution, wickedness, corruption. And then God brought Rome down. I don't know where exactly we are. But I know that every day is a gift of God, from God. It's a gift. And we should live out every day if it's a, if it, as if it's our last. That's how the New Testament lived. I'm, I'm the believers, they believed Jesus was coming. But Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, the church, the saints on the earth in the last days, they'll be known for their patience. Say patience. Because it says, here is the patience of the saints. Endurance. Endurance. Say endurance. These are those who keep the commandments of God. Obedience. And what's the final? And the faith of Jesus. The faith of God. They will demonstrate that faith. God incarnate living in His people displaying His wonder, His glory, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from faith to faith. Faith is, faith in, faith for, whatever situation comes our way, this is it. You have what it takes if you have Jesus living inside of you. You have more than enough. And the faith of. So here's how I want to pray this morning. I want to pray that God would stir up and release this kind of faith that's needed in this hour. I think it's probably a gift of faith, but it's His faith in us. And if you want this faith, you want it stirred up in you, I'm going to ask you to come. We're going to pray. 
So I'm going to pray around the altar for the release of this faith. Does that make sense? And then those of you online, how can you respond? I felt like they must respond. You don't just listen. You have to be those who grab hold of, be a doer. And so if you're driving, you can't do it. But if you're somewhere in your home, if you're driving, you can pull over. Just pull over. Believe God put you in the right place at the right time. Maybe there's a rest area. I don't know wherever you are. I don't know. It's not a word of knowledge. I don't know. It could be. It really could be. But anyway, maybe in your home, just, just step up. Just step up, step up. Say, I want this. So anyway, let's all stand. And um, if you want this faith, you say, I want this faith. I want the faith of God. I want this activated, stirred up. I want the gift of faith for the times in which I'm living, that God incarnate would live his life through me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And, and so I'm going to pray that it will be stirred up. So you come and we're going to pray. Go ahead. You just come and we're going to pray. There's going to be a release. I believe it with all my heart. And I'm standing at this altar too, Lord, because I'm here in this day, in this hour. And I need this faith. And He's going to do it. So let's just come and focus on the Lord. Worship Him. Just magnify Him. Just focus on Him. Just thank You, Jesus. Thank you, God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our God. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Lord, just come invade this altar, Lord. Holy Spirit. I had a dream last night where I was just saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I kept saying that over and over. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. That's all I said in that dream. Holy Spirit, I just kept saying that. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we yield to you. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, touch people watching online. God, in their homes. Well, let this be a a time of impartation of the faith required. It's a clarion call for the hour. And I thank you there will be a people on the earth that will demonstrate the faith that is of God for the times in the hour. Thank you, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but it's ours. We have the title deed. So I thank you, God. Lord, I'm in line too, Lord. I ask you. I thank you, God. You knew every one of us would be alive at this on this day in history and I thank you you planned you purposed that we live in this hour so Father right now in the name of Jesus of Nazareth we pray and we receive by faith the gift of faith this faith of God the faith of Jesus just say I receive I say yes, Lord. And I thank you for this gift of faith. That though I may not see, I will believe. Because my faith is in your word. In your promises. Lord, I just pray, let that be, just Lord, let it be manifest now. Lord, I ask you for that impartation. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. There's going to be uh, people that's going to rise up, maybe like that guy's daughter at UNC Chapel Hill. I don't know where your place will be. You will not be ashamed. Just say, say, I am not ashamed. I will not be ashamed. I am not embarrassed. I am not afraid of what men will do to me. My, I have a godly fear. My fear is of God. And therefore I fear no man. I fear no devil. I'm secure in my knowing who my God is. 
hands. Lord, I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you. Just say, I'm ready to preach the gospel, however, in Rome, in America, in my neighborhood, across the street, in the nations, wherever I live. And you watching online, wherever your nation is, just declare this. Say, I am ready to proclaim the gospel. And that's more than words. It is words, but it's living out, letting God incarnate, live his life out through you in the situation that he's called you in. Not looking for a, an escape, but looking for the glory of God in the midst, in that place. Does that make sense? Wow, Lord, thank you for that word. And so we just say yes and amen. Yes and amen. And I'm going to seal it. It's sealed. I know enough, you know, the parable where the, uh, the seed is sown and then the birds of the air come. How fast do they come? Immediately to steal the word that was implanted. Okay, say that won't happen. So Lord, we bind the birds of the air. I'm not going to lose what God has given me. It's mine. It's mine. And I thank you, Lord, for the harvest. For the harvest. In Jesus' name. Now, you guys watching, we always pray. We pray for people to come to Jesus. We cannot neglect that. If you're watching, you say, man, I'm under conviction here. I'm trembling. I feel like somebody's watching. You say, I'm trembling. I'm trembling. What does this mean? It means you need a Savior. And you can have a Savior. His name is Jesus. You confess with your mouth, Jesus. You believe in your heart that God has raised His Son from the dead. You will be what? Saved. So we're going to pray. Just This is the time whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're seeing folks saved by the multitudes in nations in Africa and places all over the world. It's going to happen in America. Just say, dear God, I need you. I believe in Jesus, that He is the Son of God. That he lived, he died, and he rose from the dead. I confess and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for his death. And now I choose to turn from sin. And I turn toward you, Jesus. Thank you for your resurrection. And eternal life that is mine. And I thank you, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, God bless you guys. If you go out, when you turn around, God's going to give some of you a word for the person behind you. Those of you on the last row, you're not left out. Just give a word to somebody. But I'm I'm going to ask, can we do that? Are you guys game? The first thing that comes to your mind. Now, if you don't get anything, don't worry about it. Just compliment them. Say, hey, you look good today. God bless you. You know, but I'm going to ask for faith. We got to stir it up. God, I ask for every one of the, every one of us. When we turn around and look at somebody or look up, we're going to have something from the Lord. Even if it's just God loves you. I don't know what it is. Some of you are going to get really major words from God. Downloads in the spirit, in the spirit. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of faith. Miracles. Some of you are going to say, I'm supposed to pray for you. I don't know. But on the count of three, do it. Okay, you ready? Lord, do it by faith, by faith. One, two, three. Look at somebody. Amen.